philosophy behind defense is you try to limit the offense's capabilities or options. When I'm playing defense, the first thing I try to notice is some of the weaknesses of the offensive player. And, and noticing, I look at his tendencies. Does he like to go right? Does he like to go left? Can he use his right? Can he use his left? Does he like to shoot? Or can he shoot? If he can shoot, I'm going to make him drive. If he can't shoot, well, I'm going to back off and make sure he doesn't drive, forcing him to do things that he doesn't want to do. And as a defensive player, that's what you try to do to an offensive player. You try to put him in an uncomfortable situation so he cannot be as effective. A good stance, and you got many ways of coaches trying to teach players how to get into a good defensive stance. What I'm always taught, I was always taught, is to try to be shoulder width apart. I like to put my right foot forward so that I can either direct the defensive player, the offensive player, where he wants to go. And I can react a little bit better if I'm not too wide. If I'm just shoulder width apart, I think that I can react a little bit easier. If I'm on the ball of my feet, then I'm active. I can move a lot quicker if I'm on the heels of my foot. Then that means I have to get to the ball of my feet and then react to the offensive player. Sounds complicated, which is probably why most people don't want to play defense. Now, if I know the offensive player cannot go right, then I'm going to try to force him right. So I'm putting my right foot forward, giving him the direction in terms of where I'm trying to force him, and preventing him from going the way that he probably wants to go, which is left. Now, if my offensive player wants to go left, then I am going to try to force him totally opposite of the way he wants to go. So I'm going to force him right. If he wants to go right, then I'm going to force him left. So that means I have to put my left foot forward and influence the offensive player to go this way. If I'm guarding the guy at the center of the basketball court, because my reaction is a little bit better going to my left, I am going to put my right hand or my right foot forward, forcing the offensive player that way. Now, in terms of your hands, what do you do with your hands? A lot of coaches say your right hand is going to be mirroring the basketball. So if the offensive player is starting to look for a pass, you, as a defensive player, is going to sit here and mirror the basketball so that you can kind of deflect the basketball and not give him a direct passing lane to the offensive player or his other offensive player. Your left hand, if you're taking a right foot stance where your right foot is ahead of the left and you're trying to influence him to go to his, to his right, your left, it's going to be sitting here charming at the basketball, trying to flick the basketball. Not this way, because that's how you get fouls. If the offensive player is there, you're mirroring the basketball, and you're doing this, trying to flick the basketball loose. And if you're coming from underneath the basketball, it's, you're not as often as, to foul the, the offensive player coming from underneath as you are coming from over the top. So they teach you to keep your hands here, mirror the basketball, don't give any passing lanes to the defense. I'm never scared to, to do things on the basketball court. Sure, I'm nervous because of the challenges, maybe the, the events that are, that's happening around the game itself. But once I'm out there in the motion of, of, of playing, I, am, I have total confidence in my basketball skills, and that's going to get me to be comfortable once the game starts. But once the game started, I am not nervous. Before the game, I could be nervous. I'm pretty much nervous at, at every game. But once the ball goes up for the jump ball, I think all that nervousness just kind of goes away, and I revert back to things that I've practiced, things that seem to be very routine, and I'm very comfortable in that environment. Now, in movement, when you move, as I was saying, as an offensive player, they want to attack the front foot. The reason being is, in a correct defensive movement, as you open up, to guard the defense, to guard the offensive player going to your right, to his left, you have to pivot. You have to pick up this foot, pivot, drop step, and then slide. Keeping your defensive stance, keeping your balance, keeping your, keeping your butt parallel to the floor, staying in a low position so you can move a lot quicker. Once you come out of your position and stand up, you got to go back down here before you move again. So, most Defensive coaches try to get you in a, a nice little balance where your butt is parallel to the floor and you're on the balls of your feet.
hands with mirroring the basketball, your left is here flicking at the basketball. When you open up, you stand in stance, step and slide. That's step and slide. That is the way you try to maintain a certain defense position against the offensive player. Once you come out of that position, you're in a very vulnerable position because now you got to get back into that position and then react to the offensive player. Now you see why it's a lot of work. And no one likes to do it, but yet, if you're going to be a complete basketball player, you got to be able to play both ends. And in playing both ends, you can't just score, you got to be able to play defense as well. Now, I'm going to bring my offensive player out here. Now, I'm going to look at his, his stance. I'm going to look at the way he's positioning the ball. You remember, me as an offensive player, I always said, you have to protect the basketball. So if he's not protecting the basketball, I can flick at the basketball. So you look for that. Now, if he is protecting the basketball, that means he's pretty good, knows his offensive moves. He's trying to really dictate what I'm trying to give him or force him to go. Well, as a defensive player, I'm trying to take away his options. So I'm going to step up, mirror the basketball, limit his options, force him to go one way. That way I can slide a lot easier going this way. If I can feel I can influence the offensive player to go this way and keep him going that way, and then I'm more or less guarding the player, guarding the offensive player. If I can do that, my job is done. If I can limit his options. Now, if he's a good offensive player, he wants to maximize his options. He may want to attack this front foot, which in essence now, if he comes this way, I got to drop step, slide, not coming out of my defensive stance because now I'm giving him the advantage because I got to get back in my stance and slow him down and get back in front of him. So as a defensive player, you got to work hard. You got to work hard to take away his options and limit his options. But at the same time, when he attacks you, you have to be in a good enough position to play good solid defense. You should never come out of your stance. You should always be in your stance on the ball of your feet. Hands are very active, moving, trying to limit his passing, trying to aggravate him as an offensive player, create mistakes. If he can make mistakes, he's not really good, sound offensive player. He's going to give you some options to attack him from. You just have to pick those options carefully. And not with your hands, not with poor defensive stances, but with adequate and certain fundamentals of the defensive player. So if I'm playing him, and I'm moving, I'm stepping and sliding, I'm sliding, I'm sliding, using my body, using my slide, standing in front of him, trying to contend his offensive capabilities. And then when he starts going different directions, I'm still stepping and sliding, still stepping and sliding. I'm always balanced. I'm always on the ball on my feet. All right? Takes a lot of work. No one says it's going to be easy, but to be a complete basketball player, you got to be able to play defense as well. Let's talk about seeing your man and the basketball. Uh, it's a lot of ways that coaches teach that are not really correct in the sense that you have to turn your head back and forth. We call that your head's on a swivel. It's just constantly moving back and forth. Well, the easiest way to, to attack that is to keep your head straight, away, straight at your target, straight at a straight line, using your peripheral vision to see the ball and your man. You can see these two points, and you can point to them. You don't have to do this, because every time you do this, you lose your man or the ball for a split second. But if you're keeping your head straight and using your vision in this way, you can see the ball, you can see your man. When the ball starts to move, you start to move, you change your focus point that much more so you can still maintain that peripheral vision that you can see both the ball and your man. Now, if you're going to sit there the whole time and do this and this, this and this, well, every time you hear, you lose the ball. Every time you hear, you lose your man. Even though you think you're fast enough to see both, in some players in, in our league, professional league, it only takes that little split second for you to lose your man or the ball before you now you're at a disadvantage. So if you're learning early on in your years and you want to learn now and work hard at it, focus on a point between the ball and your man and keep your head steady. You can see both. I promise you. I really don't understand the physics of jumping and how you increase that. Uh, the things that I can say that I did when I was a kid to improve my, my jumping are very basic things. I used to ride the bicycle a lot. I used to work on jumping. I used to just try to jump and try to dunk. And I guess if you exercise that muscle to that activity, somehow it's going to improve. How much it improves, no one can really dictate who's going to be the, the greatest leaper of all time or when the next 
player is going to be a great leaper. But those are the things that if you work on your jumping to a degree, it's going to improve some. Will it maximize your opportunities? No. I think to be a better basketball player, you don't have to jump high. You just have to be smart in how you utilize what you've been given. All right, let's illustrate one pass away along with two passes away. Where your focus is at a center point, and you can see man and ball, and you're denying the offensive player the basketball. So, your hands are going to be in the passing lane. Your eyes are going to be right over your hands because you can still see the ball and the offensive player, and you're in a denial situation. The denial means you're not going to let her get the basketball or let your offensive player get the basketball. I'm still, my defensive stance is still in a balanced area, so I'm not out of my defensive stance, but I'm still in my stance, and I can react to the movement of the basketball. My hands are still going to be in a position to play defense. Now, if he passes the ball over to my other friend here, which now becomes two passes away, my eye level changes to where I can see the ball and my man. If I have to point, I can point. So I'm still in a defensive stance, head straight ahead. I'm using my peripheral vision. Now, if he decides to take a dribble to the basket, I see that, I react. I step slide. Now, as a defensive team, when I move or when you see the offensive man go to the basketball, if everybody are in, is in the same stance, you see the ball movement and see your man, we're going to react to that. We're going to react to the ball, but yet we still going to see our man at the same time. That's how you team, from a team defensive stance, we call it being on a string. A good practice tool. You have seen me in certain situations, even in games. When I step to the free throw line, I'm just joking around, I may shoot a free throw with my eyes closed. Well, the purpose that I shoot it, shoot with my eyes closed is that I want to believe in the fundamentals that I've been taught or I've been practicing. So the best way to do that is to do it with your eyes closed. Nothing changes. When you step to the free throw line and you go through your ritual and you set your target and now that you close your eyes, you think the dimensions change? No. You're still 15 feet from the basket. The rim's still 10 feet high. So everything should be kept on the same plane. If you have total comfort in your free throw stroke or your fundamentals, you should be able to make that shot. Not just going to shoot with the same percentage, but when you release it, you know it's in the same target, at the same target, with the same type of shot. So, good practice tool is to start to go through your ritual, see everything, make the first one with your eyes open, so now it isn't, you have everything in real. Then go through the same ritual, look at your target, and right before you shoot it, close your eyes. It shouldn't change. But that's a good practice tool. Now, a lot of guys who don't have comfort in their free throw shot, when they close their eyes, they either shoot it short, shoot it right, shoot it left. And that's a good way to test your fundamentals under pressure. Because if you can shoot them with your eyes closed, quite naturally you can shoot them when there's six to 4,000 people paying attention to your shot. Another tool for getting the correct backspin, as I talked earlier about once the ball hits the rim and starts to bounce around a little bit, may give you a better chance of making a shot, is when you're laying at home at night and you're really bored, take your basketball, which you're probably sleeping with if you're a basketball player, and shoot straight up. Lay your head on the pillow, shoot it straight up and try to have the basketball come back on your nose. Now, if you can do that and do it with some consistency, then you get the correct form of a shot. Not just a free throw shot, but a shot in general. And the best way to do that is take it and finish it. What I used to do is I try to shoot it straight up and catch it right on my nose. And as you can see, the finish and everything, the backspin is perfect. You're shooting it off of these three fingers. Now, if you're using these two fingers, the ball is going to start to go left or right, and it's not going to end up on your nose. It's probably going to end up on your ear or miss your head to the left. And these are thoughts that you should work on, just trying to enhance your correct follow-through and your correct form as a shooter. They work for me. They may not work for you, but at least give it a try. Next thing you know, you'll be a better free throw shooter.
My shooting improved mainly because defenders started to play me differently. Uh, once I created a, an, an, an aggressive driving motion to the, to the basketball, the defenders started to play off of me, which I was forced to take that shot and be effective with that shot. So I started working on it more and more because that's exactly what the defense was giving me. So as an offensive player, sometimes you have to revert back to just taking what the defense is going to give you. You don't always have to force the issue. The defense is going to give you some weak points or some points that you have to attack. And when those points show up, you should attack. And you should attack with confidence that you can you know, force them to do other things. If the defense is going to give me an offensive uh, shot or jump shot, I should take that shot and force the defense to come out and play a little bit closer, which opens up other options. Uh, from an offensive standpoint. Triple threat is basically what it is. You have three options when you're in that stance. You can either shoot the basketball, you can pass the basketball, or you can drive the basketball. And using the, those three options, I think you should always articulate what the defense is doing to you. And three moves that I try to utilize and you see me use in the years that I played and I think it's very valuable to me, is to attack the defense based on his stance. If I'm attacking, I'm going to use a jab step. And a jab step is a quick step to get the defense to react. And if the defense does not react, then you have a lot of other options that you can go about that. So jab step with your right foot, defense does not react, you go past him, putting the ball here so that the defense cannot get to it. Now, the second move of that triple threat situation is called a crossover. And the crossover is strictly just a change of direction. And let me show you exactly the way it should be done. In protecting the basketball, you're jabbing with your right foot, and the defense sometimes reacts that way, and you want to change your direction. This is what most of the people do that's going to get, that's going to get called for traveling. In jabbing with this right foot, they get so quick, they go this way by moving the left foot, which is your pivot foot. That is traveling in any league. So the correct way to do it is when you jab, now you're going to pick up the same foot that you jabbed with and change directions. And in putting the ball down, good defensive players, if you put the ball out here, have long enough arms, got to hit it for one, can slap it. Your momentum is going this way and the ball is going that way. Good way to correct that is when you jab, now you change. If you put the ball here, you got protection from your right leg. Your hand should be here protecting the basketball anyway. So now the only way the defense can get to that ball is to go through your arms, go through your legs. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be a foul. I say nine times out of ten because I can get away with it. But I don't play anymore, so you don't have to worry about that. So, jab step, change the direction this way, putting the ball inside your leg. Now, the good thing about an offensive player is, you got to be able to go both ways. If you go one way, now you're limiting your options. The defense is going to read that, and then they become more, I guess, have the advantage to try to limit your options. As an offensive player, you never want to limit your options. So when you're working on that move to do it this way, also do it that way. So now you can have two options. If my man is taking a defensive stance, the thing that I'm looking at right now is he's playing parallel. So now he's playing me to go either way, which is good. Which it also, to me, means all I have to do is give him a nice little fake this way. He's going to think and feel that that's where the, way, that the way I'm going. My change of direction is a little bit better to use when you see a guy with the parallel stance. Mainly because he doesn't know where you're going. So now you have so many options, you just try to use as many options as you can. Now, if he had his right foot forward, that to me is saying, now, he wants you to go this way. The last thing I want to do is go where the defense wants me to go. I want to go opposite. So this is when now he takes his step that way. The change of direction means he's got to pick up this foot and open, then slide to keep up to you as an offensive player. That takes more time than you taking that crossover and driving to the hole. So you have the advantage in that sense. Now, if he has his other foot up, this is what I was telling you about being able to go both ways. Now you can do the same thing and attack it this way. You see what I mean? So now he can't limit your options. So you should look 
before you take your stance, look how the defense is playing you, and then decide which is your pivot foot, your right foot or your left foot, and then attack. For all the kids who want to be a better basketball player, I think you should improve your weaknesses to, to where they become strength, and at the same time, improve your strengths to where you don't have any weaknesses. So work at it real roundedly and try to become the best basketball player you can be. Once you get to that level, then you're an MVP in your own mind. The third part of that triple threat situation involves the shot, fake shot, and a little bit of the crossover as well as the drive to the basketball hole. So, and that is, when you jab, the defense does not react, or it does react. It takes a step back. Now, you bring the shot into motion. If you fake this, or you want to shoot it, or if you're a good shooter, this is a move you probably should use more often because it gets the defense off balance. If you jab, now you come up for the shot, nine times out of ten, if you're a good shooter, the defense is going to come this way. And as a defensive player, you never want to be out of position. Once you're out of the air or out of position, offensive player can attack that position. So when the defense goes up, now you can go this way, this way, go to the hole, stop, pull up, and shoot a jump shot. All right? If you're a good shooter, Glenn Rice, if you fake the shot or you jab, now he doesn't react or he does react, take a step back, now it opens you up for the shot. Now if you make a couple of those shots, his first reaction is, well, I can't let him shoot another jump shot. I got to come up there and challenge it. So he's going to come up and challenge. Now I'm going past him because he's out of his defensive stance. So if you see, if you understand what I'm talking about, it puts the offensive player in a great advantage because the defense the whole time is guessing. And you know when you guess, you have an opportunity of being right, and you have an opportunity of being wrong. And I like those odds as an offensive player. You're always going to protect the basketball. That's what, that goes without saying. As an offensive player, you always want to protect the basketball. And the best way that I was taught to protect the basketball in a triple threat situation is always to put your body between the ball and the defense. Good defensive players, if you put the ball out here, have long enough arms, Scotty Pippen for one, to slap it, your momentum is going this way and the ball is going that way. Good way to correct that. Because when you jab, now you change. If you put the ball here, you got protection from your right leg. Your hand should be here protecting the basketball anyway. So now the only way the defense can get to that ball is to go through your arms, go through your legs. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be a foul. Defensive boards are much more prestigious than offensive boards because defense takes a lot of work. Defense is something that everybody is not capable of doing or don't have the desire to do. If you force yourself or challenge yourself to play solid defense and you do it very well and you re receive awards for that, I think you should be very appreciative of those rewards because anybody can shoot a basketball in the hole. Very few people can stop the offensive player from doing the things that he probably would want to do. Before you take your stance, look how the defense is playing you, and then decide which is your pivot foot, your right foot or your left foot, and then attack it. If you can't, you can still do the same moves. If you're, if you're caught with the left foot being your pivot, you can still jab here and go this way. But you see the thing that you're going to have to do with that is, when you do this, you expose the basketball in transition of trying to go this way. Good defensive players have good hands. So you have to protect the ball this way, swing it low, and have a good firm hold to change your direction. If he's going to grab the basketball or grab your arm, hopefully the referee's going to see it. If you're Alvin Robinson, who I played against, they probably won't see it. So if you have a good firm hold on the basketball, you can swing it through low and strong enough to attack the defense. All right, the most difficult shot other than the free throw is a fadeaway. I get a lot of questions from kids and even grown-ups and adults about a fadeaway jump shot. Well, there's no correct fundamental way of shooting a fadeaway. I can give you some tips in terms of what to think about. 
in some of them, in some circumstances, it's, it's kind of against some of the fundamentals, but yet if you do it and you practice it enough, it can become a routine, and if you repeat it, it become a habit. Okay. In shooting a fadeaway, the one thing that you try to do is to create space between the defense. You try as much as possible to square your shoulders up so you're shooting towards your target. And a lot of the times, you're not going to be able to square them completely up, but you're going to square them up enough to it you can make your ju jump shot and make your adjustments to shoot the basketball. So, but you also got to be able to go both ways. That's the key component in terms of as an offensive player, as I mentioned earlier, you want to be able to use all aspects of the shot, not just one side, not just turning over your right shoulder, but also turning over your left. And that's another instance of trying to keep the defense off balance so they cannot limit your options. So if I'm posting up on the left block, I got a good stance, got a good balance. I feel the defense either putting the form or feeling the pressure from the defense. I can pick and choose because of the way I feel the defense pressure to go the opposite way or go opposite of where the pressure is. Sometimes I can use as a, what I call the windshield wiper. And I'll tell you what the windshield wiper is. It's a fake to go one way and yet come back the other way. So there's no different when the defense is trying to force you to go one way that you fake one way and then come back the other way, keeping the defense off balance. So if the defense is standing behind me with his forearm, his right forearm, He's trying to keep you from going to the middle. He wants you to turn that way. Well, that's when I give the old fake, come back this way. And in doing that, as you can see in the fadeaway, and I, you know, I can give you a lot more height when I have a defensive player on me, but I'm trying to show you the fundamentals of the fadeaway is when I'm turning, I'm turning with the notion of catching my target but not exposing the basketball here because the defense now can get to the basketball. So when I'm turning, I'm turning high. So when I'm turning and I'm squaring up to the target, I'm bringing the basketball at a higher portion, an angle that the defense cannot strip at the basketball. Carl Malone, Charles Barkley, all those defensive players when playing the post are very good at when you bring the ball here, it brings a little man in play, it brings a quicker defensive player into play. If you bring it here, you eliminate the little people, and it's hard for the defense to reach over your elbow and make a, king, a clean block. So, in the fadeaway, you're creating space here. As you see, my left foot is going to come back away from the defense, and you got to have strong enough wrist, and you have to practice this shot so you can make your adjustments shooting the basketball, moving away from the target which is kind of opposite of what you are taught, which is one of the reasons it's not fundamentally the shot to shoot, but it's a great shot if you perfect it to create space from the defense and yet a hard shot to play defense towards. So fade away, using my left, pushing off my legs, falling back, shooting towards the basketball. Now, it wouldn't be of any interest or purpose if you can only do it to the right side, so you got to be able to do it Fake here, doing basically the same thing, protecting the basketball, pushing off, shooting towards your target. In my earlier years, I, I think uh, crossing over, going to the, uh, my crossover step and the jab step, triple threat situation was one of my favorite moves. And then later in my years, my turn away fadeaway uh, was probably the move that defenders had a tough time stopping and it gave me the the opportunity to capitalize on the multiple defensive situations and, and uh, the double teaming that I had to deal with in the later portions of my years. As I said, now you got to be able to shoot it on both sides. It doesn't change going from that side of the court to this side of the court. Everything are basically the same. You always want to protect the basketball as an offensive player. So if I'm going baseline to shoot my fadeaway, I'm not carrying the ball low, trying to gain up and get momentum. I'm carrying it high so the defense cannot strip at the basketball. So once I carry it, my left, trying to square up my shoulders towards the target, but I'm pushing away from the target itself. Okay? When I go to the right, nothing changes from, from what happened on the other side. I'm leading with my left, carrying the ball high, pushing off, 
fading from the basketball. Now, let's do it in quick form so you can see how everything operates. Here, 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 here. All right? It takes a lot of energy from your legs. It takes a lot of loading up from your legs to get the height and the momentum going away from your target, which is not customary how you should shoot a basketball not fundamentally sound, but yet it's a shot that creates space from your defense. If you perfect it, it's hard to defend. Now you're working without the basketball. And sometimes that's very important because the defense, you keep the defense moving. And if you keep the defense moving, it can't really set up to your progress. So, in moving without the basketball, there's a lot of different ways of, of, of doing it. Reggie Miller, is a very good example of that who moves without the basketball, and that's one of his strong talents. So if you have defensive players and you have offensive players setting your screens, here are some correct ways of getting to the basketball with an open shot, squaring up, and shooting the basketball. I'm going to use my friend Fran to be the passer. And what I'm doing is using the defense, going and working towards the defense, or working with the defense to get myself open. So when I'm coming off a screen, for instance, and we're going to let my other friend be my screener. And when I'm coming off the screen, I am now feeling that I'm going to be open. So I'm going to start squaring myself up and get a shot. So as I'm coming off the screen, I see the passer. I'm squaring up with my right foot pivoting, shoulder squared to the basket, and then I'm into my shot. All right? So let, let me show you very quick how that happens. So I'm moving, squaring up, shoot. So, the basis of that, when I come off the screen, I'm squaring up, I got my target, he gives me a great pass, I use my right foot, pivoting, bring my left, my shoulders are towards your target, and now I'm in the same form to some degree as my free throw shot, which is a good form. Now, if the defense starts to cheat, say, if the defense comes here and he goes over the top, then I fade back, now, it's a different way of setting myself up. Usually, I take the left portion of my foot, square up, balance, and go toward the target. So, let's see if I can do that fast. Defense cheats, use my left, square up, shoot. That's just some ways of getting yourself working without the basketball, getting your balance, getting shot off. Then sometimes when you get in that situation, you can't get the shot off, now you work your way into the triple threat situation if you're an offensive player and you're trying to take advantage of the defense. My mental preparations for the game are very different than most. I try to relax myself. I'm a jokester, a prankster, if you want to say it that way. I try to, I listen to music, I joke around with the guys, I take my whole mind away from the game itself, and then when the time comes to focus on the game, I focus on my athletic skills, and putting it together with the team and somehow collectively going out and doing our jobs each and every day. I challenge myself to be the best basketball player every moment that I'm playing the game of basketball. And sometimes that means tricking yourself in your mind to say that you can't do this or your weaknesses are here, but yet you still try to work on improving those weaknesses. A lot of people may say, well, Michael Jordan never had weaknesses. Michael Jordan had weaknesses. He just had to dig deep inside himself to figure out what they were and challenge himself to improve those weaknesses. So mentally, I like to challenge myself to go out and play a perfect basketball game. Although I know you can't do that. It's, it's practically impossible to play a perfect game, but that doesn't mean you can't challenge yourself to do that. 